Okay, so finishing into the last steps of lipolysis, and then we'll finish up by talking a little bit about protein metabolism. The next step of lipolysis is translocation. So these long chain acyl CoA molecules don't, e don't easily traverse the inner mitochondrial membrane. So ultimately, they can't just come on in themselves and be let into the muscle cell, into the mitochondria, so we can actually just use them to produce ATP. That would be way too easy. So these fatty acyl CoA has to be transported into the mitochondria by a carrier ca called carnitine. This carnitine enzyme complex, which we'll abbreviate to CPT complex, consists of three different parts, CPT1, acetylcarnitine translocase, and then of course CPT2. Okay, CPT1 is located on the outer surface of the outer mitochondrial membrane. It functions to transfer fatty acyl groups to carnitine itself. So it strips off the CoA. Ultimately, that's what this is doing. So CPT1 is going to strip off this CoA over here. CPT1, this is the enzyme I'm talking about. It's stripping off its CoA. The acyl carnitine can then pass through the intercarnial, inner mitochondrial membrane. So ultimately, once we strip this CoA off, we can bring it into here, okay? So ultimately, it functions to transfer fatty acyl groups to carnitine and strips off the CoA. It's an important por portion. Now, this acyl carnitine complex can then pass through the inner membrane. So we see this here, CPT1. It's going to strip, strip off this CoA. And then acyl carnitine can come back down, and we can come into the inner mitochondrial matrix over here. You can see it's the inner mitochondrial matrix. And then what will happen is we will then head on into beta oxidation, and which is our next step we'll talk about. But right here, CPT1 strips off this CoA and acetylcarnitine can now traverse the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, so here's just a closer version of it. We have the CPT1. Ultimately, we're going to strip off this CoA. We're going to form acetylcarnitine. And now we can come into the mitochondrial matrix so we can engage in beta oxidation. Okay, so finishing talking about this slide right here, uh, we have acetylcarnitine come carnitine come into the inner mitochondrial matrix. Um, and then we'll have this complex here, translocase or CPT2. Um, this ultimately removes the fatty acyl portion from it. So this fatty acyl portion leaving back the carnitine. The acyl group, which is then comes into here, is then attached to a CoA again in here within the matrix of the mitochondria. So right here we have, a stri we have stripped the fatty acyl portion off and carnitine will be left over. And then this acyl group is going to reattach to a CoA within this matrix of the mitochondria. This carnitine is then, which is left over, is returned to the cytosolic side of the, of the cell and in exchange for acyl CoA car carnitine again. So this is how that loop kind of works. And then next we're going to head into beta oxidation. Okay, so step six of lipolysis is called beta oxidation. So ultimately here, fatty acetyl-CoA gets degraded into acetyl-CoA. So we are moving from acetyl-CoA to acetyl-CoA by cleaving off carbon atoms two at a time. So during these series of four reactions, FADH2 and NADH are, are also produced as a result. So the acetyl-CoA can then enter Krebs cycle to then, uh, then officially to the uh, electron transport chain for oxidative phosphorylation. And then NADH and FADH2, where are they gonna go immediately? They're gonna go right to the electron transport chain. So ultimately, what I want you to know as a beta oxidation, I don't need you to know all the steps and all these reactions and all of the intricacies here. Ultimately, these fatty acyl CoA molecules are ultimately getting degraded through a series of reactions into acetyl CoA. And just like we talked about with aerobic glycolysis, when we want to use pyruvate into acetyl-CoA to go into Krebs, Krebs, we spin around Krebs and we produce NADH and FADH2, and we send those over to the mitochondria, to the electron transport chain to produce ATP. So that's ultimately what's happening here. Like I gave that summary at the beginning of this lecture um, with the different diagrams of how glucose molecule and a fat molecule ultimately has the same end result. We're going to be reducing 
to the equivalents of acetyl-CoA, NADH, and FADH2. And then at the end of the day, same process occurs. Those either go to the uh, Krebs or the, and then finally to the electron transport chain. So that's what the point of beta oxidation is. And then step seven is what we've talked about before, what we talked about last lecture is oxidative phosphorylation. So the acetyl-CoA can enter Krebs and will spin around to get our NADH and FADH2, and then eventually to the electron transport chain. And then our NADH and FADH2 that are automatically just um, produced during beta oxidation can directly just go to the electron transport chain. So to give you a little bit of an equation down here, I'm never going to need you to calculate um, different fatty acid molecules or anything like that to see how much ATPs we're getting. I just want to show you one as an example. Um, we can ultimately use a certain fatty acid and what we need to do, we can ultimately get say 131 out uh, ATPs out of one fatty acid molecule, but we have to minus two because remember earlier I talked about that activation, we had energy input into the activation step. In order for us to activate it, we need to use two ATPs. So net gain, we can sometimes gain around 129 ATPs from one fatty acid molecule. Um, this is also going to depend on the fatty acids you used and how many carbons those fatty acids have. So some fatty acids have more carbons and some have less. Um, but ultimately this is a good example to just show you how many ATPs we can actually get out of one fatty acid molecule. Uh, this example is fatty acid palmitate. Uh, it has 16 carbons. So if we were to throw 16 carbons into this equation over here, ultimately this is what you're going to be getting. You're going to be getting 131 ATPs from this one fatty acid molecule, and then we have to minus 2 because we used them to activate ATPs, and then a total of 129. So let's compare to at the beginning of the lecture. We had a potential with one glucose molecule, if we were to go through aerobic metabolism, like through Krebs and the electron transport chain, we could maximally get about 32 to 36 ATPs from one glucose molecule. But from one free fatty acid molecule, let's just use fatty acid palmitate for an example, we can ultimately get 129. That's why we get ultimately more bang for our buck with one fatty acid molecule versus one glucose molecule. So when you train and you exercise, you ultimately want to be a better fat burner. You want to get more efficient at burning your fat and sparing your glucose and sparing your glycogen for later on during the exercise tasks. That's I'm talking more so about an aerobic athlete right now. If you are a sprinter or a jumper or um, a weightlifter, Olympic weightlifter, you're going to be training just those immediate energy source systems and those anaerobic systems. So you won't be talking what we talked about this lecture for the most part. Okay, so let's talk about endurance training and the effect on lipolysis, um, what's been shown. Um, these are just a couple summary statements. Um, again, if we're going to be using fat as an energy source for exercise, we are going to be doing aerobic metabolism. So examples again of that would be running, jogging, um, swimming, biking, so forth, those type of activities, walking, hiking, all of that we are going to be using lipolysis for. Example where we wouldn't be using lipolysis for, again, is going to be weightlifting, sprinting, jumping, all of those things will be different energy sources um, and pathways. So endurance training has been shown to increase the activity of that CPT1 complex, so carnitine transferase 1. This enhances, enhances, again, to reiterate, our translocation of fatty acids during exercise. So it's ultimately enhancing that step, so we're becoming a little bit more efficient and we can bring those fatty acid molecules into the cell a little bit more efficiently. We become more efficient at utilizing these fats during exercise. So like I said before, we become better fat burners. Um, so ultimately we are glycogen sparing. So let's use a triath triathlon athlete or a marathon athlete. We want them to be able to be better fat burners because that last half mile or so, they're gonna be using that glycogen, those glycogen stores like crazy since they're gonna be picking it up and ultimately almost sprinting towards the end. And then right at the end, you use pretty much all you got and whatever you have left in your media energy stores. Um, so the better we are at sparing those glycogen stores and our glucose, then the better we will be at, um, at exercising aerobically. We will also, with in increased endurance training, um, has been shown to increase mitochondrial density. So again, if we increase the amount of mitochondria we have, 
we can enhance oxidative work. Okay, so finishing up this lecture, the last two slides we have here um, is regarding protein metabolism. Um, with prolonged exercise, um, 120 minutes plus usually, so these are those marathon type of tasks and so forth, um, any aerobic exercise which lasts longer or during periods of starvation, um, protein may be able to be broken down to use for energy. Do we really want to um, tap into our protein stores for exercise? No, we don't. Um, proteins, of course, are pretty much our building blocks to life. This enhances uh, muscular contractions, the strength and integrity of all tissues, not just muscle tissues, but protein is pretty much our backbone to maintain the strength and integrity of all of our tissues. We really don't want to be breaking down proteins, um, and they have a lot of protective effects as well. Um, but we can use them if we need. Um, in order for us to use protein as a substrate, the nitrogen first must be removed. Um, the three major amino acids which transport nitrogen are glutamine, glutamate, and alanine. Um, cortisol stimulates protein breakdown as well. Um, the amino acid will be broken down into a carbon skeleton and an amine group which contains that nitrogen. We can then use that carbon skeleton for gluconeogenesis if necessary as well. Okay, so to finish up protein metabolism, we're not going to get into the intricacies of protein metabolism right now. Um, ultimately, what I want you to know is that we need to remove that nitrogen for the, from the, that amine group um, in order for us to use protein um, to break down for energy. So as long as you know in order for us to use protein, we need to remove that nitrogen and then we can send it through a series of manipulations in order for us to get some ATP um, from protein. And the two different processes you will read or you will see is uh, with protein metabolism is something called transamination or oxidative deamination. Um, that's ultimately what I want you to know here. And again, we really don't want to be tapping into any protein stores um, because then that's going to affect the integrity of our tissues. Um, so hopefully that's the case. We also, if um, I'd like you to know that cortisol stimulates protein breakdown. So if anyone knows anything about cortisol, cortisol is released. Um, it is a very stressful hormone, so it's released during periods of stress. Ultimately, cortisol is, is, is our evil hormone ultimately out there. It pretty much breaks down everything. It pretty much breaks down tissue and all that. That's why during high periods of stress, um, people can start breaking down um, different tissues um, if they're having constant stress being very high. So that's just another um, side bit there. But that wraps up our lecture for this week on lipolysis, gluconeogenesis, and uh, touched upon protein metabolism. So we have finished up um, our metabolic pathways for the most part, and next we're going to start into neurophysiology and muscular contractions and so forth. So we have gotten through how we act, you know, how we regulate our enzymes, how we regulate these metabolic pathways, what type of uh, ratios govern our metabolic pathways, the energy charge of our cells, um, and then if we're using carbs, fats, and proteins, how are they used for us to produce ATP in order for us to keep exercising. Um, we can review um, any time, point in time you want or anyone can set up a time with me as well. Um, we can hopefully maybe hold some review sessions if there's still any confusion on these topics. Okay, all right, thanks everyone.